Good afternoon. I'm Linda Baker, the Learning Director at the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. And on behalf of our team, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. Wherever you are located today, please join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of Indigenous peoples. We are bringing today's webinar from the Learning Network, funded by the Ministry um, here in Ontario, formerly the Ministry of the Status of Women, and the Knowledge Hub, funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Today's webinar is on recognizing and responding to the commonly misunderstood reactions to sexual assault. And it will be presented by Dr. Robin Mason and Stephanie Lanthier. Before I introduce Robin and Stephanie, I will just go through our webinar format for today. And for those of you who've joined us before, this will be a bit of a review, but important. We'll hear from our webinar speakers for one hour. And during their presentations, we invite you to type any comments or questions that you may have for them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will track those questions and then pull from them and present them to Robin and Stephanie at the end of their presentation during the last 15 minutes of the webinar from 2 p.m. to 2.15. At the end of the webinar, in the chat box, you will see a link to the evaluation. And that's the evaluation of this webinar. And as you know, if you've joined us before, we really value the responses that people provide to us through these evaluations and they help guide us when we're planning for future webinars. We'd like you to take special note today that your comments that you make and your responses on the evaluation survey are going to be shared with our presenters because your feedback will also help their evaluation strategy for this new and exciting curriculum. Once you've completed the evaluation form, you will be directed to a website where you will be prompted to enter your full name and email address. And once you've done that, a certificate of attendance will be generated and emailed to you. And I just want to stress that even though you fill in that part with your name in order to get the certificate of attendance, your name isn't associated or attached to your evaluation form at all. So the evaluations are anonymous in terms of your feedback. We'd also like to note that while our practice recently has been to include the presentations themselves in the webinar presentation, we'll actually include excerpts from the curriculum. So we're not able to post those on the website. So what you will have access to though, is the recording of Robin and Stephanie's presentation. And you'll be able to find that recording because Sarah will send out a link to everybody that registered so that they can share the recording or listen to it if they weren't able to join us today but had registered. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Dr. Robin Mason is a scientist in the Violence and Health Research Program at Women's College Hospital. Women's College Research Institute and an assistant professor at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health with a cross appointment to the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She is also the scientific lead for Women's Exchange, a research knowledge and exchange center focusing on supporting and disseminating Robin's health research. Sorry, <laughs> some of it is Robin's research, I'm sure, but disseminating women's health research across the province of Ontario and ensuring the integration of sex and gender in all health research. And you can read more about Robin on our website 
uh, on the webinar page um, to learn more about her. And I'd just like to add that Robin is on the provincial resource group for the Learning Network and has been a marvelous support um, throughout the year. So we're delighted that she's um, co-presenting this webinar today. And we're also pleased that Stephanie is joining us. Stephanie Lanthier is a PhD student, uh, candidate actually at this point in social and behavioral health sciences at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, the University of Toronto, and a trainee and research assistant with the Violence and Health Research Program at Women's College Hospital, Women's College Research Institute. And you can read more about Stephanie's credentials as well. And um, again, we're delighted to have both of these esteemed presenters with us today. And we're gonna turn the presentation over to them. Well, thank you very much, Linda, both for that really kind introduction, but also for explicating a little bit about the ways that this webinar is different from some of the webinars that you have done in the past. And it is the official launch of the new curriculum and we are so grateful for the opportunity that the Learning Network has provided to share this broadly with interested parties across the province. So in addition, I'd like to thank the Learning Network for all the work that you do in continuing to push our understanding of gender-based violence and its impact through your webinars, newsletters, and your resource collections. I also want to acknowledge the work of the co-principal investigators on this project, Dr. Janice Dumont and Sheila McDonald, as well as the numerous individuals who've been involved in helping us by sharing their knowledge, experience, and expertise. And finally, as you heard, I'm happy to introduce you to Stephanie, how fortunate we've been to have her working with us. We ask those of you joining the webinar to complete the pre-test prior to joining the webinar, and if you have done so, thank you. If not, we hope you will still take the time to do so at some point after this um, session. And before we move on to delve into the topic of commonly misunderstood reactions to sexual assault, I want to remind you, as Linda pointed out, that we are drawing upon segments or snips from the online curriculum. And these are video elements, which makes it harder to share uh, the entire presentation with you uh, post-event. The curriculum itself has more content than we can share with you during the webinar. So we hope that you'll take time to visit the website, chain, uh, complete the pretest based on your current pre-webinar understanding, if at all possible. That part will take you about five minutes. And at the end of the curriculum, a certificate of completion can be downloaded. And as you can see, the curriculum itself is in the far right-hand corner of your screen uh, with the new starburst uh, on it. So today, we are going to begin uh, with the opening that is actually found in the curriculum. And I want to let you know that the artwork that is used throughout the talk today and in the curriculum online version itself that artwork has been created by survivors of gender-based violence during their recovery work here at Women's College Hospital. We are going to describe for you the context in which the idea for this curriculum arose. We're going to outline the process that we followed in developing the curriculum, and Stephanie's going to lead that part. And then we're going to describe the curriculum content. And throughout, as I said, we're going to actually embed and draw upon elements of what is in the online version. So here we are at the very beginning of the online curriculum. And if all goes well and the internet and video gods are smiling, we will be seeing this snip. Whoops. And so far, as there is nothing normative about being sexually victimized, there cannot be a normal reaction to such a traumatic event. Recent media coverage has drawn attention to commonly held assumptions about what is and is not a normal reaction to sexual assault. When survivors maintain a relationship with the perpetrator after an assault, 
or pretend everything is fine, some may doubt that the survivor is telling the truth. Consider the following news article about a recent sexual assault case. Woman defends sending friendly emails to RCMP inspector after alleged assault. The news article outlines a court case where a woman who reported that she was sexually assaulted by a high-ranking RCMP officer was asked to defend sending emails to him following the sexual assault. I'm suggesting to you that's a very friendly thing to do, stated the defense counsel, implying that because the woman was friendly with the officer after the reported assault, she could not have been sexually assaulted. Friendly is not an invitation to sex, the woman responded. Friendly is not coming on to someone. If you choose to interpret the emails another way, that is your thought process. It has nothing to do with the intent of the email. Continuing to push the woman, the defense counsel stated that all the messages were sent after the sexual assault was reported to have occurred, again implying that had the woman been sexually assaulted, she would not have sent emails to the officer. The woman replied, they were all after the fact. Yeah, the fact that I wanted to just forget about it and move on with my life. Before we um, move on to the next slide, I want to point out to you that the question mark in the circle in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, when clicked in the online version, actually leads to additional information. But the challenging comments directed at this woman were echoed time and again in the news media. And the accuser tells the court she wanted sex the day after the alleged assault. Woman's Facebook message undermines sex assault conviction against ex-husband and so forth. Survivors coming forward to report a sexual assault have faced additional painful, injurious attacks in the courts, in the media, and from the general public. It was in response to these and other similar commentaries that we developed a proposal focused on the myriad reactions of female survivors to sexual assault. These headlines clearly demonstrate some of the challenges we face in understanding sexual assault survivors' reactions, as well as some of the potential impact of our failure to correctly interpret or understand. So I ask you to reflect for a moment. What are the underlying assumptions evident in these headlines. How do we understand these behaviors? Are these behaviors consistent with what we expect or would have expected from survivors? And actually, what do we expect and accept as uh, behaviors from survivors? Bearing in mind this opportunity for self-reflection, we will be presenting other such opportunities to think about the content that we're presenting in this webinar, but also the content as it appears in the online curriculum. There are many places where our own thoughts, our own biases, and our own beliefs may be challenged in coming to understand some of the misunderstood behaviors. I'm now going to invite Stephanie to provide you with a brief introduction to the curriculum development and the competencies around which we have organized the content. Thank you. So I'm just going to speak very briefly. We won't get into too much detail regarding how we developed the curriculum, uh, but I did want to provide an overview um, of how we went about it. So you'll see from the slide here uh, that there were a few different steps. I'm not going to speak to all of them in detail, but we started off uh, with a literature review. Uh, we then developed the competencies which were grounded in that literature. From the competencies, we, we developed the curriculum. Uh, we pilot tested the curriculum with a, with a couple of different groups, and then we finalized the curriculum before um, uploading it to online. So the curriculum itself, that we used, we drew upon three different evidence sources for the curriculum. So as I noted before, and I'll speak a little bit in more detail, is the literature review was the first step. Uh, we also uh, 
relied on our content expert groups or our advisory committee, which I will talk to speak to a little bit more. And then we also uh, used a quite a novel approach, and that was a thematic analysis of online narratives from sexual assault survivors. So again, I will speak to to a little. Uh, I'll speak to that a little bit more. So in terms of our literature review, I'm not going to get into all the details, I don't want to bore you, uh, but to just give you a sense, we, we started, we went way back to 1974 and we, we used rape trauma syndrome. So we went back to the original Burgess and Holmstrom work that was done, that was groundbreaking work at the time. And we used the outward adjustment stage, which is actually the second stage of rape trauma syndrome. Um, and we constructed an inventory of, of what we were calling at that time less understood sequelae or behaviors. And so we, that was sort of formed the base from which what we wanted to extract from the literature. So from there, we constructed search statements, um, and we did this in uh, in conjunction with our, our, our content advisory committee. Um, and then once we had the search statements, we searched scholarly and gray literature. Uh, so just to give you a sense, we used Medline, we used PsychInfo, Social Work Abstracts, as well as National Clearinghouse gu uh, Guidelines, uh, and just Google searches. And, and you'll see here that we had we came up with a number of different articles. Um, our final sample included uh, 43 articles, and these were articles that were focused on uh, adult uh, sexual assault, uh, where the victims were women, and um, they contained a less understood behavior. A uh, significant gap that came out of the literature review uh, was actually the was. The, the response and that is again where our content advisory committee was very helpful to help us address those gaps. Uh, once the literature came out, we organized the information into domains of knowledge, into sequelae or behaviors, and then as well as into recommendations. So just to speak and thank the advisory uh, committee. So we had representatives of survivor serving organizations from throughout Ontario. Uh, we tried to, uh, it was important to us and the advisory committee certainly reinforced this, that it was important for us to have um, diverse uh, voices. So we wanted to make sure that, for example, Talk for Healing uh, was involved and they um, are an Indigenous serving organization. Um, we have Women's Health and Women's Hands, Sistering. Uh, so we we had representatives from a variety of different organizations and, and it was very, very uh, helpful to us. And they really did reinforce the importance of the social and cultural context of sexual assault and influencing individual responses. Um, finally, and again, very briefly, uh, we used online narratives that came from the website Reddit, which is a, is a social media website in which survivors, I mean, certainly there's all sorts of things that are on Reddit, but there are also, there are these discussion forums or subreddits in which survivors can write in about their experiences. And again, this is a bit of a novel approach and you will see these online narratives throughout the, uh, throughout the curriculum. Um, and so it's really interesting to have this kind of survivor voice in the curriculum. And the excerpts actually really reinforced what we saw from the literature review and what we heard from the content advisory committee. So it, those, it really kind of helped us to solidify um, our findings from the other evidence sources. Uh, this is just a, a example of what is found on Reddit. I won't read this out. We certainly will see more as we move through the presentation and when you go online to, to complete the curriculum itself. So once we drew together the three different evidence sources, uh, we were able to create the competencies. Uh, the competencies, as I said, it was from bringing all those, those evidence sources together. Uh, we wrote up the competencies. Uh, they were circulated back to the advisory committee for feedback. And here you will see the finalized um, the finalized competencies. There are actually some sub competencies which are not listed here, but again, you would see this when you are in the, the when you log into the online curriculum. So very uh, briefly, uh, broad competencies, recognize the problem of sexual assault in Canada, understand the complexity of sexual assault within the context of individual and social experience, understand the neurobiology of the trauma of sexual assault, 
uh, understand and identify commonly misunderstood reactions to sexual assault, know how to respond to these reactions, and then be able to reflect on your own beliefs, values, and practices. Once we had these competencies uh, and they were finalized, that was sort of the, the building block for the curriculum. Uh, and so I will turn to speak to now a, a little bit about the curriculum content before we move on to show you um, some other segments from the curriculum. Um, so in terms of the sort of the starting point for the curriculum content, we are cognizant that there are going to be people, this is this curriculum is meant for health and social service providers, there's going to be people coming in from sort of varied backgrounds. So we start with the problem of sexual assault in Canada. It's likely not a surprise to people listening here that sexual assault continues to be a, a very serious problem in Canada uh, with a large population-based survey recently finding that women are reported approximately 555,000 incidents of sexual assault. Um, women continue to be uh, to make up the majority of victims but not all women are equally at risk so it is not like it's likely not a surprise to you as well that women from marginalized groups are more vulnerable to violence and as a result experience higher rates of sexual assault so for example we know that indigenous women in canada experience higher rates of sexual assault than non-indigenous women uh, that violence is more common among lgbtq women than heterosexual or gender conforming women and among women living with disabilities than among those who do not identify as having a disability uh, so this certainly speaks to the importance um, of the curriculum to incorporate an intersectional approach so that is to recognize that gender intersects in complex complex ways with experiences of racism, of heterosexism, of ableism, for example, among others to uniquely impact individual women's experience of sex, sexual assault, the way in which she, in quotes, reacts to the sexual assault and the care she receives if she does um, access formal support. So we will play um, the next segment now, which is um, which is the segment on intersectionality. To understand how gender affects individuals and shapes their experiences, it is important to understand the concept of intersectionality. Intersectionality describes the ways that social factors interconnect and interlock to create a diverse range of experiences. As a result, there is no singular experience of sexual assault. There are a number of social factors that intersect to uniquely impact an individual's experience of sexual assault, as well as their access to and care provided by service providers. These factors include racism, sexism, ableism, colonialism, classism, and heterosexism, among others. Reflect on how the pieces of the puzzle might fit together in different combinations and consider how the convergence of these factors may impact the way a person experiences their life. Next, consider how these interlocking factors may affect the way your client experiences sexual assault and how they may experience you and the institution you represent. For example, take a moment to think about how heterosexism may contribute to the higher rates of sexual assault experienced by bisexual women. How might it impact the survivor's reactions to the sexual assault and her willingness to talk to you about it? How might her bisexual identity impact the assumptions that you have about her and her sexual assault? Now consider how racism or ableism may impact the same bisexual woman if she is also a racialized woman or identifies as having a disability. Stephanie or Robin, um, it just froze the video. Oh, okay. So we'll skip it along and see. Let's see. Okay. Thank you for letting us know. Okay. Um, so just as a self-reflection, our second sort of self-reflection uh, piece there, um, 
we just you know, the questions that as we ask you to reflect through the curriculum, sometimes they go a bit fast and you're able to stop while you're uh, engaged in the curriculum online and to sort of stop to think about these things. But we did just want to ask, again, as a self-reflection question, how might these interlocking factors that we just showed you affect the way that your client as a service provider experiences sexual assault? And how might that client experience you, the service provider, um, and the institution uh, that you represent? And I guess what we're really asking you to think about is how might anyone's unconscious beliefs or assumptions influence their understanding of the client, of what has happened to their client, and the way that one might respond to that client? So we all have unconscious or implicit biases, false beliefs, and assumptions. These are the snap judgments or beliefs that can happen automatically without our being aware of them. But without our intentional actions to mitigate these biases, they do persist. An unconscious bias happens automatically and can be triggered by our brain making the quick judgment of people and situations influenced by our own background, cultural environment, and personal experiences. We all have unconscious biases, and these influence how we interpret events in our lives. But like any one of us, survivors of sexual assault are similarly influenced by the social norms with which they live, and the resulting unconscious or implicit beliefs they hold. And what is the impact of these beliefs on their understanding or framing of what has happened to them, including around issues of consent? Consent can be confusing. How so? Well, let's listen to this next segment to learn more. Consider the following passage written by a sexual assault survivor about her experience. I don't know positively if I've been sexually assaulted, raped. It's been eating me for a while. Even at this instant, my mind is screaming, no, you weren't, stop lying. The incident took place around three years ago. I was extremely drunk, near blacking out, and sharing a bed with my then boyfriend. I have a shitty memory, but I clearly remember him making sexual advances promptly stopped by my refusals. After that, out of nowhere, we're having sex. I don't remember saying yes, I don't remember saying no even. I just remember feeling nauseous, probably from drinking, and kind of a mixture between melancholy and regret. I remember just laying, lying, don't know which one is correct. They're kind of given up while he's doing his thing. I remember the next day, he was fine. I felt uneasy, again, probably because I was drunk. The woman states that she refused her boyfriend's sexual advances and doesn't remember giving clear consent to sexual activity at any time. Yet, she is questioning her own understanding of consent to sexual activity. In this scenario, what elements may add to her questioning? So we ask you to reflect on those elements. First, the perpetrator was an intimate partner with whom she had formerly had sexual relations but she was intoxicated and not able to fully consent or even uh, be aware of what was going on. There was no physical force that was used by the perpetrator, and she contacted the perpetrator the next day. So did she consent or not? She believes she consented. But as Johnston reminds us, it is the presence or absence it is the presence or absence of consent that is the criteria for sexual assault and not the presence or absence of distress. It's important to remember that not all survivors will be traumatized by sexual assault. However, for others, non-consensual sexual activity has multiple negative consequences, including trauma. This can be the case even if the survivor is not outwardly distressed. But for many, sexual assault can be a profoundly traumatic experience. And here we spend a few minutes on the topic of trauma, a more comprehensive discussion of trauma, its impacts and relationship to re-victimization are covered in the online curriculum. 
but here we're going to focus on the impacts of trauma in several different domains. If I can find where it is. Okay, there. Sexual assault can result in significant negative physical, psychological, emotional, social, and sexual health outcomes. Some of these outcomes may be visible, while others may be hidden or concealed by the survivor. Click on each picture to get more detail about what a survivor may experience following a sexual assault. Here we are providing you with just a couple of samples of what happens when you actively click on each of these pictures. No, she's still there. <laughs> so what we will do now is look at a segment that speaks about the neurobiological impacts of trauma. Sorry, we actually just need to go back a couple of slides to get to that. So it's at the end of this one oh. here. Yeah, we'll just skip this along Sexual a little bit. Circuitry now is in control. Better understand sexual assault survivors and their reactions in the post-assault period. Today I'm going to be talking about the neurobiology of a traumatic experience. So what happens to the brain during a sexual or physical assault? So this involves the fear circuitry, which is the most studied area in neuroscience. So what happens is one of our five senses picks up a sign of imminent danger. It could be the smell of alcohol in his breath. It could be the way he's pushing you down on the bed. And this information is transmitted to the amygdala, which then activates the H HPA axis. And when this happens, there's a release of a cascade of neurohormones to help deal with the threat. And the fear circuitry now is in control. And this change and shifts the brain. And one of the first shifts that happens is the loss of what we call prefrontal regulation. We don't think well. Part of the prefrontal cortex is deactivated, which means we can't plan, we can't do decision making, and we can't um, organize the experience into a logical sequence. This is really important because oftentimes women who are sexually assaulted are asked to account for the behavior, why and why they didn't do certain behaviors. The other shift in the brain is we shift to what's called bottom-up bottom attention. Our perceptual field narrows and we focus on what's in front of us, what's the threat, what's the danger. And what this means is we encode only what's important for our survival. We're not encoding information around the layout of the room or how many people in the room will focus entirely on, I'm in danger right now, what do I need to keep my eye on? Another survival reflex that happens is the freezing response. And this occurs when the amygdala, which is part of the fear circuitry, detects a threat and signals the brainstem to inhibit movement. So all, most victims will initially freeze. And to overcome this kind of freeze response, soldiers and police both know it requires intense training. So most girls and women have not been trained to be able to resist freezing. So instead, they have to rely on their own resources, capacity, and socialization. So what this often means is women use polite responses to dominant or aggressive men in an attempt to diffuse or not escalate their behavior. They try not to make a scene or embarrass the offender. And this is especially true if it's someone they care about, which is the case with um, in a lot of cases in relational sexual assault. Another thing they try to do is not to acknowledge it's a problem until it's over, which takes me to dissociation. Many victims will actually dissociate. They'll blank out for part of the assault. They're not going to, they're not going to fight, scream, or resist. And oftentimes, because they've dissociated, they may even talk to the offender afterwards. And these survival reflexes I've just outlined, the freezing, the dissociation, the appeasing are not consent. So Dr. Haskell has and goes on to uh, provide us with more information about the neurobiology of trauma 
its impact on the brain, and helps us to begin to put together a foundation for understanding some of the commonly misunderstood uh, behaviors that might result. So just to review, she spoke about freezing, appeasing, memory truncation, dissociation, and time sequencing that may um, not proceed in a linear fashion. In a second video, Dr. Haskell discusses how neurobiologic changes contribute to our understanding about why some survivors experience repeated or subsequent assaults. Understanding that can be important for the ways in which we can help a survivor make sense of her own life experiences. I'm not going to show that video, it is in the online curriculum. Instead, what we're going to do is turn to another segment from the curriculum to further explore some reactions survivors may experience in the aftermath of a sexual assault. And I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie. Uh, so, we are now going to uh, shift the focus from understanding survivors' reactions during uh, the sexual assault to that of understanding survivors' reactions in the post-assault uh, period. So, this is the, this is the, se the section of the curriculum that is uh, the commonly misunderstood reactions. It's sort of the meat of the curriculum. Uh, so, we are going to start uh, with a segment now. We are going to show you one example of one of the uh, commonly misunderstood reactions as well as uh, one of our graphic scenarios. Uh, we have three graphic scenarios that are in the curriculum and here I would like to uh, just uh, highlight the work of uh, Margaret Alexander and Susan Tihonen in assisting with putting these together. So I'm going to play this segment now. In a groundbreaking study conducted in 1974, Ann Burgess and Linda Holmstrom documented women's reactions to the experience of being sexually assaulted. Their findings led to understandings of what is known as rape trauma syndrome. More recent literature has added insight into the many reactions survivors have in the aftermath of sexual assault. These varied reactions represent different ways of coping with the emotional aftermath of a sexual assault, although the survivor may not identify them as such. Some of these strategies may make more intuitive sense than others, but as a service provider, your recognition of these reactions can help you understand your client and help her understand her reactions. We will now learn more about some commonly misunderstood reactions to sexual assault as documented in scientific and lay literature. For each reaction, you will be provided with an explanation, followed by some statements that illustrate the reaction. Within each explanation, you will also read the words of a sexual assault survivor. Some survivors may express the belief that forceful or coercive sexual experiences are normal occurrences, especially if these events do not lead to obvious physical or psychological injury. This coping strategy can work to limit life disruption following a sexual assault. Normalization is rooted in the stereotypical gender norms we discussed previously. It often occurs within the context of an intimate relationship or where the perpetrator is known to the survivor. To avoid thinking of a romantic partner or friend as a rapist, the survivor may try to convince themselves that aggressive sexual behavior is routine for men. Some examples of statements that illustrate normalizing include, it happens all the time. All my friends have been in this situation. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. Sometimes it is others, such as family and friends, who normalize the sexual assault when the woman discloses to them. This thinking maintains a rape culture, a culture where sexual assault is seen as normal or expected in society. As a sexual assault survivor writes, I was raped, but I never reported it. Too many people convinced me that despite my intense fear reaction and subsequent mental breakdown, waking up to the man I trusted, fingers inside my vagina, and then attempting to put his penis inside and ignoring my first no was just normal boundary testing. Take a moment to consider Priya's story. How might you understand Priya's reaction to the experience of sexual assault? It's Friday night, and high school students Priya, 
Emma, and Abigail are at an all-ages show downtown where one of their favorite local DJs is playing. They have been there for only 20 minutes when Priya sees a guy smiling at them from across the room. Priya starts to walk towards him. OMG, he's so cute. What are you doing? Um, that is not like her. I'm kind of worried. I know, right? And especially because of what happened that time with Jason. I thought for sure she'd be afraid of guys after that. I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want to have fun. Later that weekend, it's Sunday night and Priya can't concentrate on her homework. I think Jason is actually a really good guy. He's so cute and smart and popular. Everybody loves him. This kind of thing happens all the time. So why am I making such a big deal out of it? The following morning, Priya waits in the science wing for Abigail and Emma. Hey, want to go out again? Hey, what are you smiling about? I just texted Jason for a date. So that was just an example of one of the commonly misunderstood reactions that we cover in the curriculum. Uh, so you'll, you, have, you would have seen from the first part of the segment that there are lots of other ones as well. Uh, but we wanted to give you just sort of a taste of what, uh, what it looks like as well as we wanted to give you, provide you an example of one of the graphic scenarios. So in thinking about the graphic scenario and thinking about Priya's story, uh, we just want you to reflect on uh, what you think, if you are coming from a service provider perspective, might be going on here. So might this be an example of attempting to normalize the situation? And are there other ways to understand Priya's behavior? So certainly some of the other commonly misunderstood reactions uh, might be able to help us uh, understand her behavior. Uh, but, what we, but what I would like to speak about a little bit now is that her behavior might also be an example of what is known as unacknowledged sexual assault. Uh, so unacknowledged sexual assault uh, is defined in the literature as a coercive sexual experience that meets the definition of sexual assault, but the woman does not label it as a sexual assault. Um, and so this is where a woman might, um, you know, be talking about that there was a bad experience or might not, might not feel like, you know, may feel that something may have happened, but doesn't want to say, oh, I was sexually assaulted. And we spend a lot of time and we have a whole section devoted in the curriculum to understanding unacknowledged sexual assault, uh, because it not only did it help, it's sort of this burgeoning literature at this point, although there has been writing about this for uh, many years. Mary Koss, for example, called it hidden rape. Uh, but it has really, it helps us to understand uh, so it builds on, sorry, it builds upon the rape trauma syndrome literature, but also helps us to understand why women who have been sexually assaulted may exhibit the, some of these behaviors or reactions that we talked about. So normalizing, minimizing, justifying the acts of sexual assault. And it's important to remember at this point as well that much of this, this, these kinds of minimization, normalization reactions that happen uh, is due to the fact that we live in a society that as a society, we also normalize and minimize and justify sexual assault. So I'm gonna play you a scenario uh, about uh, that reflects unacknowledged sexual assault now. Let's now consider the following narrative written by a survivor. As you listen, reflect on your emotional response to the narrative. Think about what you might say to her if she was your client. So I have a friend who I've hooked up with a few times in the past. We've never had sex. The last time we hooked up, he wanted to, but I said no. Last night we were making out and he really wanted to, but I kept telling him I didn't want to. Some direct quotes from me. We're not having sex. This is not happening. If you keep pressing this point, I'm putting you in a cabin, sending you home. Stop, stop, stop. He kept saying, we both want it. And I would reply, um, I don't know, that's questionable. He entered me anyway, and I didn't put up a physical fight, even though I told him to stop repeatedly. After he was in, I guess I was just thinking, ugh, and let it happen anyway. To top it all off, he came inside me accidentally. I've already taken plan B less than an hour after it happened, not sure what to expect. 
I don't know if this even counts as rape because he's a friend, because I didn't physically resist him and I let him continue. I don't know what it was. It just isn't really sitting right with me today. I'm not that concerned about pregnancy or STDs. I don't know what I'm looking for. I guess I just need a listening ear. I don't want to tell anyone in real life, including especially my best friends. I don't know how to treat him now. Part of me is furious with him for not listening to me right at the start when I was very clear I didn't want to have sex. Part of me just doesn't want this to be a thing and I just want it to blow over and forget about it. So I don't know whether I should just treat him casually the way I have when we've hooked up in the past or if I should actually be upset with him or bring it up with him. I don't know if that's worth it. You may have found that your initial emotional response to the narrative was one of confusion. You may have questioned whether the writer was, in fact, sexually assaulted. It can be difficult to know how to respond to clients who themselves are unsure whether they have been sexually assaulted or those who suggest that they would just like to forget about the incident and move on with their life. The burgeoning field of unacknowledged sexual assault may help you provide supportive responses when you encounter survivors who do not acknowledge a coercive sexual experience as sexual assault or who present with commonly misunderstood reactions to sexual assault. In the next section, we will discuss ways of responding to clients who are experiencing varied reactions to an incident of sexual assault. Um, so I, before we move on to talking about responses to sexual assault, I just want to highlight that this segment um, actually brought forth some really important challenges uh, to responding um, to a survivor. If a survivor, for example, as the, uh, the survivor did in this segment, is acting confused about whether a, an assault occurred, uh, is minimizing the assault, is going back and forth, I'm not really sure uh, if I was assaulted or is this just a bad sexual experience. And it's important to think about and to reflect on because again, as we talked about previously with unconscious bias and our underlying assumptions that when we hear a narrative like that we our first reaction might be to think well that that survivor was not necessarily sexually assaulted uh, so it's just important to reflect um, you know and to be continually sort of reflecting um, on again our own underlying assumptions beliefs etc um, and we are going to talk about a little bit more about that as we move into um, discussing how to respond appropriately to commonly misunderstood reactions. I just want to point out at uh, this point, um, as we have this slide up here about disclosure challenges, that in previous curricula that we have developed and that are housed on the same website, and in particular the curriculum called um, responding to disclosures, delayed disclosures of sexual assault in clinical settings. We talk a lot about the disclosure process and how to respond to disclosures after the fact and sometimes quite long after the sexual assault itself has occurred. So if you are interested in learning more about disclosures and how to support disclosure, how to create environments that are conducive to disclosures, and then how to respond appropriately, you might want to also look at that curriculum. But we are now moving on to the responding to sexual assault survivors in this next section. And we will focus this afternoon on introducing how to respond in helpful ways to survivors' varied reactions to sexual assault. And here we drew on two sources of literature, actually three. Um, trauma-informed care, trauma and violence-informed care, or TVIC, and the responses to unacknowledged sexual assault. So trauma-informed care tells us that anyone we encounter may have experienced something traumatic in their past and encourage us to provide a supportive response and to avoid re-traumatizing, re-victimizing, or otherwise hurting individuals who may have experienced past trauma. But trauma and violence-informed care expands upon the concept, moving beyond the impacts of interpersonal violence or, or individualized uh, trauma to also consider the intersecting effects of systemic oppression and structural violence. 
So in a trauma and violence informed approach, we've drawn heavily on the work that our colleagues out in British Columbia have done and are going to read the principles that they have defined a trauma and violence informed approach by. The first of these is to understand trauma and violence and its impact on people's lives and behaviors. The behaviors associated with that principle include listening, believing, and validating and affirming your client, and focusing on your client's strengths and helping them to recognize those strengths. Second is to create emotionally and physically safe environments for clients and service providers. And here we're encouraged to use a non-judgmental approach, create a sense of connection, and provide clear information about referrals or programs. Foster opportunities for choice for our clients, collaboration, and connection. The behaviors associated are be open and use active listening, outline choices for referrals and or treatment, and then work collaboratively with the client to consider those choices and allow her to make final decisions. Provide strengths-based and capacity-building approach to support client coping and resilience. Here we would do the psychoeducational work of educating the client about trauma, its impact, and a variety of coping skills and strategies, highlighting the coping skills, the healthy coping skills that the client may already be practicing and encouraging healthy um, coping. Here the talk about the neurobiological and other effects of trauma and strategy for dealing with triggers can be particularly helpful. With, it is incumbent upon us to take the steps to ensure that we do not further hurt or cause inadvertent pain to our clients or patients through our interpersonal interactions or our institution's practices. And this last point can be much more challenging to address. Our institutional practices, such as having clients repeat their stories to different providers time and time again, can be considered um, a traumatic experience and a, an example of where an institution's practices can further serve to injure, hurt, or traumatize uh, clients or patients. With respect to unacknowledged sexual assault, the literature and our expert advisory committee have the following recommendations. As Stephanie has pointed out, the literature itself at this point is pretty scant, and it was really the expertise and practice-based knowledge of our content experts that have guided us very much in this realm um, and have echoed what uh, Johnston has actually put into a frame. So these include be aware that your client may be a survivor of sexual assault even if she doesn't label it as such or use those words. Anticipate that your client's initial response may be to, di to dismiss or normalize the experience. Avoid using words like rape, sexual assault, victim, or survivor if your client hasn't used those words. Instead, use the words that the client has used or talk about types of coercive or unwanted sexual experiences and their potential impact. Although in this curriculum we do look at both helpful and not helpful providers to a client, we want to finish with an example from the curriculum of a positive encounter, one that follows the principles outlined in the preceding slides. Consider the interaction between the service provider and Claire again, keeping in mind what you have just learned about responding to unacknowledged sexual assault. Hi Claire, nice to see you again. What can I help you with today? I'm just not feeling the best. I was um, at a party last night. Did something happen at the party that upset you? Um, not really. I'm just pretty hungover today. I just something um, sexual happened with this guy and I, I don't know how to explain it. I just kind of don't feel right today. Can you tell me what doesn't feel right? No, um, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe. I was, just, I was just really drunk and I didn't really tell him to stop. 
Well, like, I don't really remember, but I'm fine, just hung over. He's a friend I've hooked up with before. I'm sure he just didn't understand that I wasn't feeling that good. I called him today and everything seemed normal. Lots of women have experiences with guys where they feel like they didn't exactly agree to what happened. For example, a woman may not remember consenting to sex or particular sex acts. I just, I just don't know what happened. I go back and forth between feeling like I must have made a mistake and feeling like he kind of did something to me, but I'm not completely freaking out. I feel like if some bad sexual thing happened to me, then I would be really upset and I'm not. My friends would think they would think I was being stupid or I'm just sorry about what happened. This kind of thing happens all the time. I am, I'm just fine. Women react to these types of experiences in many different ways and often in ways that one might not expect. Many women try to put the experience out of their mind or try to convince themselves that it's not a big deal because that makes it feel less distressing. They also may not want to think of their friend or boyfriend as being capable of acting in that way. It is important to remember that no matter how a woman reacts to the experience, it is not her fault. She has done nothing wrong. I think, I think I just need some time to process what happened. I'm sorry that this happened to you, Claire. If or when you would like to, we could talk more about what happened. Sometimes when this type of experience happens with a friend or a boyfriend, it can happen again. I am here to help, and there are resources available if you would like them. Well, clearly that is an interaction that might not happen in the time that we've actually portrayed it. It could be that that kind of exchange happens over a series of visits. This was a simulated encounter to demonstrate, illustrating some of the principles um, that we had described earlier. That brings us to the end of the webinar, um, our portion of the webinar. Soon we're going to get to hear from you. I, again, I would like to thank the Learning Network for hosting us and thank you for your attention. I would also like to ask that you go online to complete the full curriculum. Our funders are very interested in the number of those who log in and work through it. And if you find it useful, we encourage you to please share it with others or recommend it to others in your networks. Here again is the website info, http slash slash vaw.dveducation.ca. Uh, you can also access this just through uh, dveducation.ca, and thank you again. Okay, well, thank you, Robin and Stephanie. Um, such an exciting curriculum and such a needed curriculum, and we're so grateful to both of you for taking the time, one, for being part of the team that developed it, but also taking the time to share it through this platform today and, and to launch it. And we want to go right to questions because there are so many. And I'm going to start with some relatively straightforward ones, I think. But could you speak to the intended audience for the curriculum? Certainly. Um, and I'm hoping that that question has emerged because people think it has more audience relevance than we initially had planned for. When we actually put in the proposal, we specified that it would be particularly useful health and social service providers. But through our pilot testing we actually, and a recent meeting we've had with our knowledge translation um, advisory group, we've heard that there is much greater applicability than we may have originally foreseen. So for example, we piloted it with a group of Crown attorneys uh, the prosecutors of sexual assault cases across the province who said that they thought victim witness programs would be really interested in the curriculum. We heard um, specifically that we should consider introducing it into um, university and community college level programs instead of trying to do the continuation, continuing education after graduation to try and embed the material early on in health professional practice uh, training programs. Um, we have also been using it uh, with our students in the uh, 
Women's College Research Institute summer program. Our summer students have been really interested in it. So those are the audiences we've thought of, but I'd be thrilled to hear that others have other suggestions or ideas that we might not have considered. Robin and Stephanie, one of the other uh, inquiries is about, will it be available in French? Unfortunately, the province hasn't given us uh, the funding for translation. Um, if there are any community groups out there that would be interested in helping to fund such an enterprise, we'd be love, you know, we would love to speak with them. Um, formerly, we did have funding for French translations and one of the first curricula that we developed, DV in clinical settings, a good portion of that curriculum is available in a, in a French version. Unfortunately, the numbers who actually access the French translated version, and we worked with Fran our Francophone colleagues in de um, developing it in a culturally appropriate manner, the numbers um, have been quite low. Is there a cost, Robin? Some people were just curious. No, it's available free of charge. It's been funded by the province, by the government of Ontario, and so it is um, available free of charge. Uh, again, our, our hope for it is that individuals go online and complete the pre-test, the post-test, and some of the demographic info so we can report back to the funders that their investment has been worthwhile and it's made a significant difference in um, providers' approaches to and understandings of how to support survivors of sexual assault. And will you welcome people to access this curriculum while it's based in Ontario, its development, even if they live in other parts of Canada or the world? Oh, absolutely. There is nothing in the content that is um, locale specific. There's nothing in the content that is just for, uh, based on an uh, Ontario experience or an Ontario audience. And what about the length to complete? I realize that sometimes that's going to differ depending on how many options, like your question marks that someone chooses to yeah. click on. But is there an approximate length of time? that it would take somebody to complete the program? So without clicking on the program, what we try to do here is to distill all the information into the most relevant, most critical, most helpful pieces uh, for learners. So without uh, clicking on the links or the additional information, um, it, the intersectionality puzzle pieces, how long it takes you to read, Without doing any of those elements, we estimate that it's about a one hour, perhaps an hour and 15 minutes, similar to the layout today, um, but without our talking. <laughs> <laughs> With the clicks and the links, it's a much richer experience. And again, as in the content itself, we suggest people go and visit the prior curriculum on um, disclosing past sexual assault. It, so people could spend a couple of hours, but again, the essential and most critical core information probably is accessible in an hour, hour and a half at the outside. One of the questions, and it seems particularly relevant as it is now for the intended audience, but also if you extend or expand potential audiences, is what provisions are there in the curriculum itself to assist people who may be triggered as they are um, going through the curriculum? Actually, we haven't provided um, uh, supports within the curriculum itself. And it's a really good point that you raise. Uh, in the curriculum that's on the similar web, on the same website here, I don't know if I still have control, here, the Making Connections curriculum, there is a whole section there on, um, re, on vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, self-care, and strategies um, to reinvigorate and re-energize and, and fill us back up. 
And if as providers, we're starting to feel the burden um, of caring for others. But within this curriculum, we actually didn't do that. Um, but it is a good point that's been raised by someone mm -hmm. there. And I think they meant it Wonder generally as you've responded, uh, Robin, but they also were thinking of the number of women in service provider roles who also may be survivors or people with lived yeah. experience of sexual yes. Yes, that is, that is also how I've understood it. And I am uh, just talking with Stephanie um, during your sending this question to us about whether we might want to put some kind of notice right in the text underneath any one of these curricula mm -hmm. about reaching out for help or um, a trigger warning. Yeah. Okay. yeah. One of the other questions you've talked about possible reactions to sexual assault and some of the um, reactions to disclosures. And the question is, would we expect, does the literature help us understand or did it come out in your consultations, potential similarities or differences of responses in terms of someone experiencing sexual harassment, say in a workplace, versus sexual assault? Um, so in terms of, I'm trying to, I, see, I'm going back to thinking, in ter I can speak to the literature review. I, I don't think we ever, I mean, we sort of, when we talked about, when we talk about sexual violence, and of course sexual harassment falls under that sort of umbrella, in terms of the literature searches, our focus was on assault, sexual assault. Assault. Um, and so oftentimes in the workplace violence literature, for example, it would come up as sexual harassment. So we did, I don't think those types of, of um, studies were included in our literature search. Um, but I mean, I would, I would think, although I'm going to defer to Robin on this, that the strategies that are provided in the curriculum would be applicable to, to any um, incident that would fall under that sexual violence um, umbrella. So I would think that they could be applicable to sexual harassment as well. I don't know. What do you think? I, I think that um, sexual harassment is as challenging, if not even more so challenging for those who are being so victimized to understand the processes of what is happening and that self-doubt and um, is even harder to overcome in some instances because her, the harassing behaviors can be so subtle um, that it can be hard, I think, for individuals to name and claim what it is that is actually going on in a harassing situation. And then in terms of the way that the general public has understood sexual harassment, certainly sexual harassment in the workplace, there's been a real gap in the way um, we've understood it, although there are now there is now legislation, gladly, and finally legislation mandating workplaces to um, do not only a response to sexual harassment, but also to provide training on sexual harassment. And I know that you and your colleagues have done a lot of that work there um, out of London. But as Stephanie said, our literature was actually focused much more on the behaviors um, associated with sexual assault, um, particularly because at the time that we put the proposal together, there was so much vitriol in the, in the media um, around the cases that were then being um, pushed through the justice system, I'm thinking about the Gian Gomeshi case in particular, there was a lot of vitriol and very hateful language that came up and out of the media that was our inspiration for thinking about why, why is it so hard to understand? Why do we challenge survivors' veracity, the truth of what they are telling us, if they also try to make contact with the perpetrator after the fact? And what is actually going on in that instance? What does that behavior tell us? And what is going on in that survivor's mind when she is trying to perhaps pursue the relationship? 
Is she seeking an explanation? Is she seeking an apology? Did she recognize at the time what happened or has that recognition happened um, over time and through considering the events post hoc, I guess I would say. I hope that answers. I guess the real answer is no. <laughs> There have been a, a number of comments and questions that relate to LGBTQ plus um, individuals and sexual assaults and wondering to what extent that's addressed in the current curriculum and depending on your answer also is there a, a plan to develop something more specific in the future. Uh, so, uh, in response to the first question, while we acknowledge that the um, experiences of intersecting identities can very much influence how someone understands what happens and the ways that they respond to it, we haven't highlighted in particular uh, sexual assault of the LGBTQTS uh, members or individuals in part because the preponderance of victims have been um, female victims with male perpetrators. And so we pose it as a series of self-reflection questions. What might be different? How might it influence what you do? How might it influence how a survivor understands what happens? Having said that, there are plans underway. Um, our colleague uh, Janice Dumont and Sheila McDonald have been working very closely with the LGBTQ2S communities to develop um, a curriculum specific to that community's experiences of sexual violence. Um, I just want to I just want to add that although we haven't specified any particular um, groups as or looked at the victim ex survivor experience through the lens of particular communities or particular groups of individuals, what we do think is that the experiences and behaviors that we have looked at and the strategies to respond to those behaviors are generalizable to different communities, although they may need some additional tweaking, that the general um, information is more broadly applicable. Thank you. Um, another comment, uh, actually a number of comments, and we'll sort of roll them all into one area. A number of people were interested in having you comment further as presenters on the nature of the relationship between vulnerability, poverty, housing instability, homelessness, and sexual assault, and the areas that you've been exploring. Maybe I'll just stop there for a moment. Do you wanna respond? So I think that what those comments are all speaking to are vulnerabilities. And one of the things that, um, is evident is that more vulnerable individuals and those from vulnerable communities are at greater risk of experiencing sexual assault. Having said all that, I always think it's important to balance the notion of vulnerability with resilience. Um, and certainly when we talked about how to respond um, through the trauma and violence informed um, responses, emphasizing that within even these vulnerable communities, individuals have enormous strengths and often communities themselves have enormous strengths and capacity to um, manage um, some of those negative, harmful, hurtful experiences. So I think it's just really important that we balance the talk of vulnerability while recognizing that there are many, many different ways um, that individuals' risks are increased, um, certainly homelessness being one of them and uh, the poverty that sometimes leads to homelessness. But not to just put everyone into that same basket of vulnerability, I think it's important we think about individuals and their resilience and their strengths and capacities at the same time. 
Hold on, I think Stephanie is adding. Yeah, I just also wanted to draw attention to that if, if you are completing the curriculum, as you click on some of these question marks, you will have questions that would be related. For example, that there is a question mark uh, that relates to like a self-reflection on consent um, among, you know, if a, um, among a homeless woman, for example. So there are examples that are peppered throughout the curriculum that might speak to a specific uh, community or a specific group. Uh, we didn't draw attention to them in, in the presentation okay. here, but they are, they are there in the curriculum. One of the other, thank you, Stephanie. One of the other comments was that while this is so important, once someone gets to somebody, for support or, or and no matter what brings them through the door that they didn't want any of us to forget that there are substantial barriers that may prevent racialized women and others from even getting to the door of a service that can provide some support. Uh, I think that's really important and, and the ways that we can create safe spaces for all individuals is really important for us to bear in mind as well as whatever avenues we can think that may uh, facilitate or help people overcome the challenges related to access for certainly racialized or impoverished or homeless women but also for Indigenous women who may only be able to access um, services in an urban setting, the women who are experiencing sexual assault where their service providers are few and far between um, are facing additional challenges in, in receiving help or receiving the care that they may actually require. When we were putting this particular curriculum together, we were also just thinking that the given the numbers what we know about the numbers of women who have been sexually assaulted um, care providers in diverse settings not just healthcare settings and not just the social service settings are likely to encounter women who have been sexually assaulted and they may disclose to someone who hadn't necessarily been thinking about those issues in the past but it's a, a listening warm and empathic person who may receive a disclosure and then not totally know what to do with it which is what we looked at in our earlier curriculum or in this one it could be someone who is um, seeing a friend's behavior as in the case of that Priya graphic case and not really be able to understand what's been going on in that friend's life that would be leading to that kind of behavior. So it, we have um, taken a very sort of basic approach to thinking about and speaking about these issues and how to respond in helpful and caring ways that are appropriate to uh, survivors' needs. Robin, the final um, comment that we would ask you to make is that people are interested in knowing if they would like to make further inquiries about the curriculum, how do they do that is one of the questions. And I know that part of people's interest in speaking with yourself or someone else on the team is about their seeing potential um, aspects of the curriculum, components of the curriculum that could be really useful in their own education efforts and outreach. Um, for instance, through a sexual assault center or other settings. And so just wondering in our final seconds, um, a response to that. Uh, we would be thrilled for people to uptake and use the curriculum. What I can say is that we can't provide the kinds of snips or video cuts that we've used with you in this webinar today. Um, but people can um, put the online link up in a classroom setting, for example. They can stop it and have discussions at different points. Um, they could move it through to a section that they want to focus on if they set it up in advance of the class. 
uh, but we are unable to provide the kinds of cuts that we did today. And I think if people want to discuss any of those options, um, you could share my email. It may be up on the biography, I'm not sure. Um, and if not, I am fine for you to add it to the biography. If someone is sitting with their pen and paper right now, it's Robin, R-O-B-I-N dot Mason, M-A-S-O-N, that's S is in Samuel, at WCHospital.ca. That is so helpful, Robin. And again, thank you to both Stephanie, yourself, Robin, and the rest of your team. And I just think this is going to be an amazing value-added addition to training resources. Um, that are being developed in Ontario and elsewhere. So thank you so much. And with that- And I thank you. Okay. And with that, we're going to sign off and please complete the evaluation. And the link will be in the chat box and we'll look forward to having you join us at future webinars. Bye for now. <laughs>